Hello, Calc Kids. This is Mr. Bean, and today we're going to have a lesson on the fundamental theorem of calculus again, but this time we'll tie it together with definite integrals. This incredibly important lesson, you'll see why, is as important to integrals as, if you look back, think back to when we did derivatives, as the power rule was to derivatives. Remember how when we first did power rule, if you didn't understand that one, you're going to be lost with all the other tricks on how to do derivatives. So that's what this lesson is like with respect to integrals. You have to understand this one. So make sure you really get this one down quite well. So we're going to talk about today antiderivatives. An antiderivative of a function is a function capital F whose derivative is f. Now, what does this mean? It's just this. Here's a quick little example. If you've got 3x squared as a function, its derivative would be 6x. We know that from the power rule, 2 comes down, blah, blah. All right, so that means the expression 3x squared is considered an antiderivative of 6x. Now, how do we know that? Because if I take the derivative of 3x squared, you get 6x. If you take the derivative of something and get 6x, then the 6x's antiderivative would be what you started with. Okay, that's it's basically just antiderivative is going the other direction. Now, here's what's really weird about this. An antiderivative within an integral, it represents the area under the curve. When we are taking an integral from a to b of some function, that is actually taking the antiderivative, and the antiderivative would represent the area under the curve from A to B. That is the, the antiderivative helps us get that. That's really weird connection. Like, why does that work? It's not even something that was intuitively seen by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz way back when they were first studying what this calculus stuff was all about. They didn't even see that at first. So let's talk first about power rule and then how you take the antiderivative. So power rule, if you remember, we would do this already. You know how to do this. Multiply by the old exponent, just bring it down to the front, and then you subtract one from the exponent. So there's our new exponent. All right, now if I'm doing antiderivative, I'm going to swap these steps and do the inverse of them. So instead of subtracting one from the exponent, I add one to the exponent. And then step two is the power rules step one, where we now, instead of multiplying, we divide by the new exponent. Okay, so those are our steps for taking the antiderivative. So you think here, you add one to the exponent, adding one, and then you divide by whatever that new exponent is. So it will look like this, x raised to the n plus one, all divided by whatever that n plus one is. All right, so get that written down and let's jump into examples. So I'm going to find the antiderivative of this. That'll be my capital F of x. And that's going to equal, I take x squared, I add one to it, so now it's three, and then I divide by that new number three. And then I have to do a plus capital C. This capital C stands for a constant, any constant I want. Now I have to include that when I'm finding the function that's an antiderivative because, and we'll talk more about this next lesson, okay? I'm just briefly talking about this C right now, but that's because any number this is, if you take its derivative, so now let's go down and what's f prime of x, its derivative would be three comes down, cancels with that three, x squared plus the derivative of any constant is zero. So that would then lead us back to where we started. So that's why we put the plus C, it's just to represent all families of functions that could be this. So plus any, so there are actually an infinite number of answers depending on what this C value is. All right, so let's do this one. So before I take the antiderivative, I'm first going to rewrite this f of x as 5x cubed plus 6x to the negative three minus one. This is like when we did the power rule with derivatives, it helped to rewrite it first. It's the same with antiderivatives. If you wanna rewrite it first to be able to tell what our exponents are, it might help just a little bit. So now we add, so it's gonna be five x to the add one fourth, and then divide by that number four, plus six x to the add one. Remember you're adding to a negative number, so that's negative two. Big mistake here is when you make that a negative four, kids do that all the time, that's wrong. And then you divide by what that new exponent is, so that's negative two. And then minus, how do you take the antiderivative of a constant? Well, you just have to think, this is like the derivative answer. What's the antiderivative of that? It's x, because the derivative of negative x would get you back to negative one. So when it's a constant, you just throw on that. That is the coefficient of x. Okay, now can we clean this up a little bit? Yeah, I think we can. So, oh, plus c, forgot the plus c. So our f of x equals five, force x to the fourth, 
And then here we have a minus because that negative two, so minus on top we'll have a three, six divided by two, and on bottom we'll have our x squared minus x plus some constant c. And then the last one of this set of examples, let's rewrite this first before we take the antiderivative. So f of x equals x raised to the one half plus three x raised to the negative one half. Okay, what happens now? Capital F of x equals, add one to that exponent. It's x raised to the, adding one makes this three halves. Add one full, two over two. And then we have to divide by three halves plus three x to the add one to negative one half and you get a full one half positive and then divide by that same exponent one half and then i'll add my constant at the end here plus c so this is weird i hate it when i got fractions inside a fraction so don't treat it like that let's rewrite this to hopefully make a lot more sense you don't divide by fractions you multiply their reciprocals so i'm going to multiply by two thirds x raised to the three halves plus, and then again here, instead of dividing by one half, I'll multiply by two. So it's three times two is six, x to the one half, or you could have written square root of x, plus my constant c. And there's my answers. So this rule is vital to understand before we go on to do the, the rest of these integrals. You've got to know how to take this antiderivative step with these adding one to the exponent and then dividing by that same number. Now to something where hopefully you don't start getting confused. The antiderivatives of sine and cosine, or the integrals of sine and cosine. So let's start with this one. It's a little easier. This one is what's behind my little white box here. Cosine of x. What would the derivative be? What, what do I take the derivative of to get an answer of cosine? Well, that's just sine. Oh, I got to add my plus c. Whoops. Plus some constant. I got to put a plus c there. So sine of x plus c. That would be the antiderivative of a cosine x because the derivative of sine is cosine. So now that leads us to this one, which is a little different. This one would be negative cosine of x and then add my plus c. Now, why negative? Because the derivative of cosine, remember, the derivative of cosine x is equal to negative sine x. So if I was taking the integral of negative sine x, I would get cosine x. If I'm taking the integral of positive sine x, it would have to be negative cosine x, right? Because if I took the derivative of negative cosine x, that would then give me positive sine x. So that's where that comes from. Again, I don't, don't get confused with how the memorization works. I find it, it easiest for most students if they just keep the memorization of the derivative and then here they work backwards to make sure that it works and you can always when you're done you take the derivative real quick just to see if you did it right all right now it leads us to the fundamental theorem of calculus part one Remember earlier in the year, I talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus a few lessons ago, and we did part two. That's because most textbooks do this one first. They'll talk about this as part one, and then later on, they'll get to part the, the other part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so here we go. If f is a continuous function on this interval a to b, the area under the curve is this definite integral. We've already talked about that in several lessons, that that's what this represents. But instead of doing summation notation and a long, crazy thing, there is a way to do this fast. And that is, you take the antiderivative, capital F, you plug in the upper bound, B, and then you subtract the antiderivative with a, uh, the lower bound, A, plugged in. And then that represents our area under the curve. Okay, so get that written down and let's do it. So we're talking about this function, four minus six X, it's just some straight line, the slope of negative six. And we're talking about the area under the curve from negative two to five, so the area between that and the x-axis. So this will, what, the way we do this is we're going to take the antiderivative first. So I'll say the antiderivative of four is four x. Why? Because its derivative is four. And then minus, we take six x, add two, one to the exponent, so not squared, and then divide by that same number, two. And then I'm gonna draw a line over here. And this line, there's lots of ways that you might see it and sometimes textbooks will do bracket. Sometimes they'll maybe have a little bracket this way. They'll do it all sorts of different ways. Most of the ways I've seen it is just a quick little line. So we're gonna do this line from negative two to five. This little line just is a placeholder to remind me that I'm, I still haven't plugged in my boundaries. I should mention real quick, I know I did not put a plus C for my constant of that antiderivative, but that's because you'll see in just a second, it would cancel out. Those C's, the C would be totally gone here. I'll show you that in just a minute. So what I'm going to do naturally is write my five in red so that you can kind of see the difference of what I'm doing here. So I will first plug in the five. The upper boundary goes first. So I will say bracket four times five minus, 
And now this is just three, right? Six divided by two is three. So it's three X squared. So it's a five. Okay, so that whole thing is just the five plugged in. Now I subtract, why am I subtracting? Because that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. I do the antiderivative with a B plugged in minus antiderivative with an A plugged in. So now plug in that A and I get, let's do my brackets here, four times negative two minus, I'm trying to write small because I'm running out of room. Six divided by two again was three. So I have three and then negative two squared. Oh man, sorry, I went over to number five. Okay, now simplify this up. 20 minus five squared, 25 times three, 75 minus, open parentheses, four times negative two, negative eight minus three times positive four, 12. Negative 55 minus a negative 20. So that actually makes it plus 20. And then that leads us to negative 35. Now let's check with our calculator, see if this worked. So I'm gonna type in the math menu and then option number nine is the integral. Eight was the derivative, nine is integral. Let's do nine. And then I'm going from negative two to five. So we go negative two up to my upper bound of five. And then I have to type in four minus six X. And then that's all with respect to X. Enter, negative 35, okay, good. So we're, we've got that one right, we did it. So let's go on. Now before I try to take the antiderivative, let's rewrite this because it will help us if I can see the exponents, x to the one half minus x to the negative two um, with respect to x. Okay, so now the antiderivative is add one. I get x raised to the three halves, all divided by three halves, minus x to the add one, I get negative one, all divided by negative one. And then I'm evaluating it from one to four, and the upper bound gets plugged in first. Before I do this, I'm gonna simplify this even more. So this is two thirds x raised to the three halves plus one over x, and I'm evaluating it from one to four. Okay, now let's go ahead and start plugging in these numbers. So the upper bound goes in first, two thirds, four raised to the three halves. Oh, I made a mistake right there, somebody caught it. That wasn't a fourth, that was an X. I was ahead of myself in my head. That was supposed to drop down, make that an X, sorry about that. Okay, so now we say plus one fourth bracket, subtract. Now we'll plug in the one. So one gets plugged in here, that's easy. That's just two thirds plus one gets plugged in there, one. Okay, now it's just simplifying these things. And I would give you a suggestion. Remember when you have this three halves here, the two on bottom means square root. I would start off with that. So make that, two thirds times the square root of four is two, and then two to the third power is eight. Makes it a lot easier if you do the bottom, the bottom of the fraction first for these exponents. Plus one fourth, and then this is uh, three over three plus two over three is five over three. Okay, now it's just a matter of going back to our elementary school and remembering how to add fractions. So I'm just gonna skip ahead on this one. 16 thirds plus one fourth minus five thirds. I've gotta get a common denominator of 12. So that gives me 64 twelfths plus 3 twelfths minus 20 twelfths. And then that all equals 47 twelfths. Now, let's check our calculator. Math 9, integral from 1 to 4. And then that is the square root of x minus 1 divided by x squared all with respect to x. Okay, hit enter. 3.91667. Now, is that the same thing as that? Let's check. 47 divided by 12. Enter. Yes, it is. That's awesome. Okay, good. So we're good on that one. Thank goodness I would have been off. I did that one wrong. Okay, so now we go on number six. So we go, this four could actually just come out if you want. Remember that that property of, uh, that properties of integrals. So you could treat it like this. And now you're going to pause. That's right. Do this one on your own. So pause the video and then let's come back and see if you did it right. And you should have come up with just the number four. You can see what I did, follow my work here. You could have also brought this negative. You could have brought it out with the negative four and just left it off on the side if you didn't want to do with the negative on the inside. So there's several ways you can manipulate this to work it out, but that's how what you should have come up with was four. Okay, last type of problem you're gonna see in today's practice. And that is when you are given the derivative, remember that the derivative represents the rate of change. So they'll give us the derivative and then we have one point of the original function. We know f of one equals negative two. So remember, that's just a coordinate point, one comma negative two. What they wanna know is what is the y value at x equals three? What we can do is, what, this, what we're trying to do is figure out the accumulation of change between one and three. So we start at negative two and we're going to add 
the integral of how much it's changed between one and three, and that only works if we have f prime. This has to be f prime right here with respect to x, and it is. So f prime, if we take the integral of f prime, that gives us an accumulation of the rate of change. That's what we've been doing throughout this unit. So on this graph, what it represents is this little piece right here is negative, and then this piece, that is all positive. But when we do the integral right here, this one to three, that takes care of all that for us. The one to three is going to include the negative, it's going to include the positive, figure it all out for us. So now that's the setup, and then we just work through what we've just been practicing. So we're gonna have the, in, the antiderivative now, x to the third power divided by the three minus the antiderivative of negative two is negative two x. And then I'm gonna evaluate that from one to three. So I, this was negative two was my starting point, and now I'm adding the area under the curve. So in this case, it's going to be three cubed, 27 divided by three, nine, minus two times three is six. Now I plug in the one, so I did the lower bound, that's one third minus two. And then from there, we just simplify. So three minus one third is two and two thirds, 2.6 repeating. Boom, that is what f of three is. So f of three equals two and two thirds. And we got that because we added the integral, the area under the curve of f prime, because that'll give us the net change, how much things are changing by accumulation. Okay, that's everything for uh, this lesson. Rock that master check, and I'll see you back in our next one.